Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly Q&A session. You ask the questions in the comments down there and we get back to you with technical related answers. Uh, don't forget to use that hashtag. Uh, you can also send us email related questions if you can't access the comments. Uh, that is to hellotech at gmbn.com, although the comments is where it's at. Uh, first up this week is from Jacka Subic. Hi guys, loving the show. Cheers Jacka, I appreciate that. I've got a new Canada habit and I'm loving the bike. I don't, however, have the time to go, uh, to go to trail every day after work, so I ride whatever I can, which could be dirt jumps or pump tracks, uh, as well as trails. What's the most important setting on shocks for this sort of stuff? More air, more rebound, or just add some compression? Thanks. Um, depends how you want the bike to feel, to be honest. Uh, for a pump track, for example, you don't want to be losing energy through your suspension. Uh, so ideally, run your suspension quite firm. Uh, now, I wouldn't run it with the lockout on, but if you've got, say, a three-position lever on your shock, I'd run it in the middle setting. It'll keep your bike a bit more firmed up and it'll keep it up in the travel. Uh, definitely go for a higher air pressure in the shock, and the same for the fork if you can. You want to try and keep the bike quite balanced. And I'd actually say adding more rebound is a good thing, because uh, you don't really want to sort of the bike bobbing around too much. If you can just be a bit more controlled, you can be able to put that energy into the backside and get a bit of sort of a bit more pump out of it as you like. Uh, just make sure you don't go too crazy on your settings. You know, I see people messing around with shocks and adding loads of rebound and loads of compression, and your bike can feel a bit horrible. So uh, just go a couple of clicks at a time and try and find what works best for you. And obviously, don't go over the max pressure. Uh, it will say there'll be a little decal on your shock itself, and it'll say maybe 250 pounds or 350, depending on what it is. Uh, don't go over that. Next up's from Benedict. Uh, a friend of mine asked for some advice on a bike he wants to buy. Unfortunately, I couldn't help, so I'm hoping you can. He wants to buy a Vitus Mythique VRS 29er. Uh, that's a rad looking bike. Uh, this is it on the screen now, actually. It's a really nice bike. Great geometry on there. Uh, so it's an entry level full sus trail bike. I've been over the specs and it seems to be up to modern standards, except it comes with an Imperial uh, Stroke Legacy sized rear suspension shock. Is that a deal breaker? Um, is Imperial sizing a dead end by now? No, I don't think so. Uh, so in case you're wondering, there was uh, what you're calling legacy, so the Imperial measurements, and there's the metric measurements. Essentially, metric shocks have uh, simplified the way that bicycle manufacturers can spec shocks on their bikes. There's less measurements, and effectively it enables the shocks all to have consistency between them. You, in the past, with the legacy sizing, you could get some obscure sized shocks that the body itself didn't have that much room in for oil, and you'd by the time you've crammed the shaft in there with all the shims and that, you could end up with a shock that was a bit inconsistent in its behavior, perhaps on long descents, for example, when it gets overheated, uh, compared to the exact same spec shock in a different size. The idea really with the metric system is that whatever size shock you fit on there, it will perform the same as the same model shock in a different size. So that's really it. The shock on that Vitus will be absolutely fine and it won't be an issue. Um, it's not an obscure size at all. It works really well, to be fair, on there. I'd, I'd snap one up, to be honest. I think Vitus look like fantastic bikes. Okay, next is over to Greg Sellerton. I've never dented or bent a rim in my life, even when I was younger and more aggressive. I really love my new bike, but it doesn't have the same snappy quick feel that my old bike had. And it's almost 10 pounds heavier, so I guess that is to be expected. Um, I'm looking to make some upgrades and reduce the rotational weight first. Smart man, that is the best place to make an upgrade on your bike. Um, and I was wondering if you had specific ideas for wheel stroke tyre builds, uh, possibly carbon or 29, uh, that would make my bike feel a little faster rolling, a better climber, and easier to accelerate up to speed. Okay, so, well, firstly, looking at your bike, this is it on the screen here, so well, thank you for sending that image in. It's got big old 2.6 inch tyres. So, do you really need a tyre with that much footprint? For sure, those tires are very good and they've got plenty of grip, but being that big and being that soft compound rubber, they're gonna roll a bit slower. So you could just start by looking at different styles of tire. If you like the volume of that at 2.6, perhaps look at something that's got slightly less tread on it. For example, uh, your tire has a similar sort of open tread design as this Vittoria tire here. And you can see obviously a tire tread like that is gonna cut into the terrain really well but it's obviously not gonna roll quite as fast as something with lower, closer packed knobs. Of course, you have to make sure that the tire is gonna be compatible with the type of terrain that you're gonna ride, but this is gonna roll significantly faster than a tire like this. Perhaps 
An option might be to have a faster rolling tyre on the rear of your bike and opt for something a bit more grippy on the front for control. Uh, personally, that's what I do on all of my bikes. I'd rather sacrifice a little bit of grip out back to increase my rolling or sort of minimise the rolling resistance so the bike rolls that bit quicker. Some riders choose to have the same tread pattern on a tyre and might opt for a harder compound rubber on the rear and a softer on the front. You can achieve a similar effect. It will roll slightly faster. But wheels is where, where it's at, really. Uh, a lightweight set of wheels definitely will transform the way your bike rolls. Um, I wouldn't be too hooked up on looking at carbon. Carbon, by all means, you can get extremely lightweight wheels, but they come at a severe cost. You can get some really, really good value alloy wheels out there that are going to still be a lot lighter than what's on your bike. So I would advise looking for some good value wheels, perhaps something from Raceface or Mavic, or there's loads of great brands out there that offer decent wheels that are gonna suit your bike. Um, I would go, if you're gonna stick with a 2.6 tires, I would go for a minimum of 28 millimeter wide rims, probably a 30 just for safety because it's gonna keep the tire a good shape. But I'd actually be inclined to go down to a 2.5 uh, or even a 2.4 if you want your bike to be a bit lighter and roll quicker. Big tyres combined with big rims, going to be heavy and be a little bit sluggish. By all means, it's going to have a nice sort of good footprint on the ground, but not necessarily what you want. So have a little rethink on your tyres and also have a look for some decent alloy wheels. You don't necessarily need the high price of carbon. It's not actually going to make your bike any better. It's just going to make it more expensive. Uh, next up is from Jay Clark. Hi Dolly, I purchased a Pivot Firebird 29 and the bike shop gave me the bike and the instruction manual and sent me out the door. I'm just wondering if they should have given me any extra components like volume spacers or brake blocks. Uh, did bike manufacturers send extras out to bike shops to be given to the end user? Um, well actually yeah, there's a pedal, uh, I think it's a pedal cycle safety recommendation scheme or regulations. Um, your bike should have been sold with reflectors, so front and rear reflectors, pedal reflectors and wheel reflectors. The bike shop doesn't actually have to put them on the bike but they have to supply you them. Um, I don't think it's a law, it's a regulation but it's kind of like a safety standard really. Uh, but I'm guessing that that's not something you're that interested in. It should have the manual. Uh, quite often, like brands like Canyon include volume spacers uh, for RockShox or Fox, depending on what the bike is specced with. They sometimes come with uh, some assembly compound and grease, uh, some Allen keys, a few small tools, stuff like that. But you don't tend to see like consumable items like brake pads. When you wear those out, that's up to you to replace those. Um, but there's a good chance your bike might have come with some volume spacers uh, and some little extra bits. So I would ask them because they might have just forgotten to give you that stuff. Bike shops are generally pretty thorough with that sort of thing. Uh, so you might have just been unlucky and just walked out with that manual. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd give them a call and see if there were any extra bits that you might want. Okay, over to Luke Downey now. What does five clicks out mean for rebound? Okay, so with Rebound and compression, you're going to hear these terms. There's two ways of referring to the amount of uh, damping that you're putting on to the shock. So if you screw the dials all the way in, so it's fully closed, yeah, you can have clicks out. So that's what they're referring to here. So five clicks out of rebound means five clicks back from fully closed. But some manufacturers do this the opposite way around, from fully open, but that would be clicks on rather than clicks out. Uh, next up is from Tamiya Fan. Tamiya fan? Does that mean you're into radio control cars? I used to have a Tamiya and I had a Kyosho as well actually. Um, I watched a video where the guy was talking about pros and cons to having a car tyre on the back of a motorbike and to my surprise when he took the motorbike tyre off it had an inner tube. He then sealed up all the spoke holes with some type of clear sealant and that's all he did to make it tubeless. Could you do the same with bicycle rims? Uh, basically instead of using a rim tape to make a tubeless setup that will never leak. Um, yeah, you could, but I'm not sure why you'd want to go that route. It's quite messy. And you've got to bear in mind, motorbike wheels are very strong. It's not that often you're going to have to adjust the spoke tension on there if it's got spokes, um, or even replace the spoke. Whereas on a mountain bike, it's quite easy to snap a spoke, and you're going to need to replace them. And also, just with uh, general maintenance on the bike, you're going to need to sort of adjust the spoke nipples on there to adjust the tension of the wheel. So by putting sealant in those holes in the rim, you can actually get in the way of that stuff. That said though, it's kind of quite a cool idea. I'd be tempted to uh, use some bathroom sealant, you know, you can get it in white or clear, and give it a try myself actually, just to see how well that could work. I'll come back to you on that one, but um, I don't think you should do it, it's quite messy, and tape is the easy way to do it. If you insist on not paying for a dedicated rim tape kit, you could use Gorilla Tape or something like that, although you're never gonna get the best effect. Dedicated rim tape will always be best. Over to Malt Stolly. 
I want to make my new and my first mountain bike, a Nuke Proof Scout, roll on tubeless tyres, but I've got a question. Now, I've seen people in videos fix tyres um, when they've got a puncture with the little plugs, and I've also seen them put inner tubes in there. But what do you do when you get home to fix the tyre again? Uh, I really enjoy the GMBM videos. Keep up the great work. Sorry for my bad English. I'm not a native speaker. Hey, your English is great. It's my reading. That's probably bad. Okay, so there's various different things that can happen to tyre when you get a puncture. So, for example, if you get a puncture on the top of the carcass, you're right, you can use those plugs. Uh, they're tubeless plugs and you push them in. That's going to get you home, but actually, naturally, the tyre or the air pressure in it is going to start pushing that plug out. So if you want to make it a permanent repair, get some vulcanizing solution, which you get in regular puncture repair kits, and basically trim the plug down and put some vulcanizing solution on and let that set, and do the same on the inside of the tire carcass as well. Another little thing you can do, if you are really unlucky, you get a slash in the sidewall of the tire. If you're on a trail, you might need to put like something tough in there. It could be like a bank card, a credit card, um, some money, anything kind of stiff that's gonna stop the inner tube from poking out there, because you will need an inner tube to get home if you do slash that. Don't go throwing your tire away just yet because you can actually repair that. Um, it takes a bit more dedication, but you can use like some fishing wire or any sort of dedicated thread, uh, something very tough you want. You can actually stitch it up and then you can use the vulcanizing solution and patch it and you could still use the tire. I actually made a video on that quite a while back. Um, maybe I should be making that sort of video again, do an updated video with all the different ways you could fix a puncher. Uh, I guess if you think that's a great idea, let me know and we'd love to know some more ideas for you guys and videos we should make because I quite like making videos. Um, thanks for hanging around guys. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so and we'll see you next time.